how to knit perfect swatches and get gauge every time. Hi everyone, my name is Norman, I run the blog nimbleneedles.com and I want you to become a better knitter and that's why in today's video I will explore five common mistakes you may be making when knitting a gauge swatch and how to fix them. Are you one of these knitters who never seems to be able to get gauge? The pattern tells you to use needle size 3 and fingering yarn and it feels like whatever you do, you can never meet the specifications of the designer on your first try or you actually do and your finished project still ends up being too big or too small. Then keep on watching because in this tutorial I will talk about how you can improve your swatches. Some solutions are super easy. Sometimes uh, the problem can be traced to a wrong tape or ruler where the markings are off. But often it's not that easy and that's why this video will focus on very important pattern theory and practical knitting tips. like tying knots in your cast on tail or using eyelets in the first row to remember the needle size you used. Anyway, let's dive right into it and show you everything you need to know about knitting gauge swatches and of course like this video right now to support my work. Right here at the beginning I want to impart one very important lesson to you. If you never seem to be able to get gauge on your first try, that is nothing, I repeat, nothing to worry about. In fact, it's a testament to your unique creativity and knitting style. You are not a robot and not a knitting machine, but an individual crafter expressing their personality. And that is something to celebrate and nothing to worry about in and by itself and make sure to comment if you like this message. Issue number one, knitting gauge swatches that are too small. Maybe you have seen my video on knitting neat edges. I'll link it to you up in here just in case. But in that video I show you why knitting behaves a little bit differently on the edges. Anyone who has ever knitted a lace shawl might have experienced how their edges ended up being too tight when you try to block things. So when you knit a swatch and it's too small, meaning you come too close to the edges when you measure, your readings will be off because typically the fabric is a bit distorted and not as stretchy there. And if you block your swatch, the pins will distort things even further. And you will also notice that you will knit a bit differently mid-row as well. So typically you fall into a rhythm when knitting. But this rhythm will be different if you have 200 stitches on your needle, so 20. So it's very important that your swatches are big enough. And big probably means 6 or 7 by 7 inches. So you can comfortably measure 4 by 4 inches in the middle with a wide margin to the left and to the right. And I know this sounds awfully big, but it's the only way to get accurate readings. And here's one tip if you are working on a small project say wrist warmers or so, where the whole project is barely bigger than those 7x7 seven seven inches. Well, you can also knit a very small swatch to get a good feeling for the yarn and the pattern, take some good guesses and just start knitting the first couple of rows and treat that as your swatch. Try things on and check if you need to adjust things. The worst that can happen is that you need to unravel things, but it's not like you are going to use that big swatch either. Reason number two, you used a flat swatch for a project in the round. The second common issue is one a bit harder to address. A lot of patterns are knit on circular needles or double pointed needles. So when you knit a swatch, you absolutely need to make sure you knit it using the exact same technique. Why? Well, your purl tension might be a bit different than your knit tension. When you knit stock knit stitch in the round, you never end up purling, which means your flat swatch where you alternate between knit and purl rows will probably have a different row gauge. If I pull this swatch here apart, you can maybe see that those purl rows, I try to replicate this, that those purl rows are a tiny bit looser. But here comes the difficult part. 40 stitches in the round actually won't get you a big cube. 
and 40 stitches is already a lot of knitting for a small swatch. So what you will often hear is that you should uh, knit a small diameter swatch and then cut it open and measure it flat. So like this. The problem no matter how hard you try, your fabric will always behave a little bit different around the gaps. This is commonly known as ladders. If you knit a small diameter tubular object, you will also spend a lot of time shuffling needles around and this will also influence your fabric. As a result, your readings might be off as well if you cast on too few stitches for your swatch in the round. You can solve this by knitting a gauge swatch flat with a special technique. So when you are at the end of the row, you don't turn your work around. Instead, you drag the working yarn all the way back to the right side, leave enough slack here and just start knitting across again. And the result will be a rather unsightly swatch that tries to replicate your knit in the round tension, but is faster to knit and easier to measure. Of course, it has to be sufficiently big as well as the fabric will behave even weirder around the edges, especially if it's a slicker yarn. <laughs> Reason number three, you didn't wash, block or weigh your swatch. Knitted fabric will often change a bit after you washed it the first time. Often you end up blocking your finished project as well. And if you are knitting a sweater, there's quite a lot of weight resting here on those shoulder seams. So before you measure your swatch, no matter how diligently you knitted it, make sure that you treat this swatch the exact same way you would treat your finished object. A lot of uh, fibers loosen up a lot after the first wear. So if you are knitting a sweater, you might want to consider attaching very little waist to your uh, swatch after it's completely dry and let it hang out overnight to see what's happening. Just a little bit to simulate the, I don't know, 200 grams of fabric that will pull here on your shoulder seams. Reason number four, you used the wrong knitting stitch pattern. The last problem is actually the same problem I already mentioned when it comes to circular projects, but there is a twist. Say the pattern provides you with a gauge in stockinette stitch. You diligently knitted in the round, got gauge, but then the pattern transitions to a knit purl combination and suddenly your different pearl tension comes into play and wrecks all your careful planning because the designer's fabric didn't show this discrepancy or vice versa. Now, sadly, there is no easy way to fix this through normal means. But I frequently received the question, well, Norman, which pattern should I knit the gauge swatch in? Well, the answer is, the instructions should tell you which knitting stitch pattern to pick. But if you develop your own pattern, you might want to knit multiple swatches. Only a couple of weeks ago, a subscriber asked which selvage stitch uh, was best for a scarf, where they wanted to start in garter stitch, then stockinette stitch, ribbing, brioche stitch, and a whole lot of other uh, nice knitting stitch patterns. But I told them uh, that without increases or decreases or switching needle sizes, that scarf would have ended up with quite the meandering edge. So when I knit ribbings, which is quite stretchy, I usually go down a needle size. And when I knit a section of stranded color work, I go up a needle size. I have a headband pattern here on YouTube where you can see how I do this in case you are interested. But it's very important to realize that gauge only applies to the very knitting stitch pattern you used for your swatch and a different pattern will have a different gauge. Part two, how to get gauge. Now that we covered why your swatch might be off, we need to talk about how to get gauge. What are those little things you can change to make a pattern work out for you? So you knit your perfect swatch, you count and there it is, you're off. Either one or two stitches, one or two rows or both. So what can you do? Number one, knitting with bigger or smaller needles. The obvious choice is picking a knitting needle that is slightly bigger or smaller, knit another swatch and see where it gets you. Remember, that's why I said uh, use eyelets, uh, pearl stitches or knots in the tail so you can easily see which needle size you use for which swatch. 
What might be less obvious is that knitting needles are in fact not all the exact same size. If you compare 3 mm or size 3 uh, needles from different brands, you will notice that some of them are actually a tiny bit bigger or smaller. For example, the Carbons needles, I really like them, I'll link you my review up in here, they are typically a fraction of a millimeter thicker. So they are not 3 millimeters, but often 3.1 millimeters thick. That's just 3.3% thicker, but as a result, your stitches will need a bit more space on your needles. So if you have 30 stitches on your needles, that would mean that a swatch might be one stitch wider. 30 times 3.3. Now, this is of course simplified math, but it's uh, it's just to show you that even a tiny variation can have a significant effect because often it's that one stitch you are looking for and not those 40 or so. Number two, use a different needle material. In a similar way, you might notice how different needle materials will make you knit tighter or looser. Bamboo, for example, it has a lot of friction. Well, metal is super slick and so on. And that is also something you can toy around with when you cannot get gauge. In the past years, these cubic needles became quite popular and you will notice that they might be marketed as size three or so, but will behave quite a bit differently. And again, it's those little things that can make a big difference because often the pattern tells you to use size three and you cannot get gauge and your swatch is too tight. So you go up one needle size and then it's too loose. And this middle ground can often be found by using a different needle material or brand. Now there are two more tips I want to mention, but these are a tiny bit more difficult. First, of course, you can change yarn because the actual diameter of your yarn also determines your stitch gauge. But not all DK or worsted yarn has the same diameter. There simply isn't any standardization there. But the yarn so it needs space on your knitting needle. So um, the actual diameter of your yarn, imagine you have 20 stitches on your needle and you squish them together. The diameter of your yarn will determine the minimum space each stitch needs on your knitting needles. But it's going to be the exact same um, space no matter your knitting needles. If you use a size four, uh, four or five needle, it's, the stitch is going where the yarn needs exact same space. And you know, that's actually why knitting ribbing with smaller needles usually creates neither results. I'll link you my tutorial up in here in case you are interested. Now, for many reasons, changing yarn is often not a viable option. But if you notice that you just can't get it right and there is a significant difference, sometimes it means this yarn and this pattern just won't go together. And it can be things like trying to knit a fitted sweater with a loosely spun super drapey alpaca yarn. And if you don't want to end up with a tunic, then you might have to give it a pass. The second thing is trying to change your tension. There are two things that influence the gauge of a fabric. The size of the stitches is defined by the barrel of your knitting needles. So if you tighten up after every stitch, each stitch will be of that size. But some people knit a bit looser and they don't tighten up. So there's some slack on the needles and the bigger the loop is, the bigger your row gauge will be. And the second thing that influences your gauge is the little strand between two stitches. I talked about this in the video about knitting needle ribbings I just mentioned. I'll also put the link in the description. Um, and you know, people who knit a lot of stranded knitting might know this trick. To create nice floats, you need to stretch out the stitches here on the right needle and not keep things bunched up. And in a similar manner, the farther you keep the stitches apart while knitting, the bigger the little strand between two stitches will be. And the bigger that strand is, the bigger your stitch gauge. That being said, for all practical reasons, I doubt it is feasible to adjust your tension by trying to knit tighter or looser. What will typically happen is that somewhere mid row or after three or four rounds, you will fall back into your old rhythm and it takes incredible concentration and willpower to switch between two different tensioning methods 
consistently and that's what you're looking for. I mean, you can change your knitting style with practice, sure enough, but I don't think you can change it on short notice for this pattern and then go back to being a tight knitter for the next pattern. What you can try is tensioning your yarn differently. So I typically keep my yarn around my pinky finger and usually wrapped around twice. But if I only wrap it around once, my tension will be looser. I can also wrap it around my index finger and this too will translate into my gauge. You could try to teach yourself uh, another knitting style and when you can't seem to meet gauge, maybe you try English or combination knitting and see if that gets you anywhere. But in all honesty, I don't think those are feasible methods. Part three, let's talk about why I think knitting perfect gauge swatches is actually impossible. Mark my words, everything I said so far was just a preface to what I actually wanted to get at. We went through quite a lot of theory here and quite a lot of different techniques. But if you want my honest opinion, it's all for nothing and getting gauge is a nice illusion. Why? Well, because there's no standardization. There are two main, two main problems. First, before you measure your swatch, you need to block it. But how much do you stretch it in either direction? You might stretch it by 10% and the designer by 12% or not at all. Knitted fabric is very elastic and you might end up setting your pin five millimeters too far to the left. And for a bigger swatch, that's only a tiny little step, but it might mean that you count one more stitch. Also, some designers will measure the gauge on the finished object. Others take the readings from a swatch. And without wanting to blame anyone specifically, in some cases samples have been machine knit on top of that. And the resulting fabric will behave differently than hand knit fabric because the stitches they sit uh, straight on the hooks and not twisted as they are on needles. So your uh, stitch gauge will always be different. So there's a lot of murky in between the lines that you can only guess at. And it might mean that even if you get gauge, your finished project doesn't fit the way it should because you stretched your gauge swatch too much and there's not enough negative ease left. And the second issue has to do with the way gauge is recorded and I personally wish this would change. A uh, typical gauge is 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters and then it says something like 20 stitches times 28 rows. It never says 28.3 rows. But that's the reality. No knitted fabric magically squeezes itself into the metric or imperial system and preferably both at the same time. I mean, four inches aren't even 10 centimeters to begin with. It's 10.16 centimeters. But that would mean that knitting stitches were always whole numbered parts of 10 centimeters, no matter your yarn or needle size. And as a result, there would be no need to uh, get gauge to begin with. So a proper gauge would be 20 stitches are uh, 12.3 centimeters and 20 rows 9.5 centimeters. And that would enable you to replicate things correctly. Very often those decimals are dropped. Now I can understand why the system works the way it does and I do it too, myself. I mean, and you wouldn't be able to produce these nice uh, gauge rulers. But it also means that depending on how you or the designer handles a fractional stitch, you might still be off despite getting gauge. And the smaller your gauge me measurements and the heavier your, your yarn, the bigger the problem will be. So if it's just a five um, times five centimeter swatch and there is a half stitch, but you only have 10 stitches, then that half stitch would be 5%. And a difference of 5% could be as much as one full size when you need a hat or a glove. So what's the solution to this conundrum? Measurements and good patterns, especially when it comes to fitted garments. If you know how long the arms should be, 
you can simply measure your work in progress and possibly try it on. It's not the first time and not the last time I'm going to say these two very important things. First, don't ever wait until the end to try a work in progress on or measure things. Even if it's a seamed sweater, you can still use pins and try it on or compare it with similar garments in your wardrobe. And the second thing, it's totally okay to unravel and sometimes part of the process. Because, you know, there are just so many variables and it's just so easy to get one of them wrong and the result will be a wrong size. Take notes, figure out what you need to change, frog things and start a better version all over again. Or live with the mistakes and use your notes to improve the next project. Your first socks might be off, but all those little mistakes are a testament to your creativity and your ability to learn. And if you use them to improve, then you will become a better knitter. If you complain about them, the design or the pattern, you will only become frustrated. So I personally would focus on the things that you can change. The first time you try a recipe, the first time you try to paint something, you probably don't hit the mark 100% either. What makes knitting different is both the combination of the many variables and the time it takes. If your first chocolate chip cookies were maybe a bit too crisp, well, you do them again or try another recipe. That's, I don't know, $5 and two hours wasted. But for a sweater, you often spend $100 or more on yarn and it may take you weeks or even months to finish. So that's probably something you want but may not be able to nail the first time simply because it's your first time. So what I usually do is I knit my swatches, wash them, block them, but then I mainly use them to see how the fabric behaves and see, you know, if the yarn works very well with this particular pattern. So when I look at my work in progress, when I measure things or try things on, then I know, okay, this will still give a bit after washing or things will look much neater and so on. Of course, I mean, I will use my gauge to from this watch to calculate the cast on and so on, but but it's very important that this will only be the first step for me. And also this means that I typically don't use a different yarn brand or yarn base for each project. As tempting as this may be, I try to stick to a selected few yarn bases that I know work well for me and my knitting style. So I don't end up knitting endless swatches and frogging things one time too often. Anyway, that's how to knit gauge swatches. Please like this video if you enjoyed watching and also as this video has been requested by so many of my subscribers, make sure to comment if there's any other topic you want me to record a video about. And of course, consider subscribing to my channel in case you don't want to miss any new videos. Happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.